Hello, hello, and welcome to another episode of the Call to Adventure pod with me, George B. So spring is finally here. The weather's improving and there's a general spring in everybody's step. Looking forward to summertime adventures. If you don't have anything in the diary yet, head over to calltoadventure.uk, get yourself booked on something fun. We've got everything from wild camping to mountaineering, ski touring, rock climbing, and even some kayaking, which brings us nicely on to today's episode. So today we're chatting with Dan Yates, a keen kayaker himself and a co-founder of Save Our Rivers, and he's recently joined Protect Our Winters. So Dan, welcome to the show. Brilliant. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, looking forward to having a chat. So we were catching up just before the podcast and we met at Kendall Mountain Festival uh, at a Patagonia Action, Work, Action Works event that was probably was four or five years ago. It, yeah, I think so. It was a while ago. Kendall festivals all run a little bit into one, I think. Uh, I go, I go <laughs> most years. It's, it's probably my favourite event in the calendar. Um, but they do all get a bit blurry, and uh, I, I might struggle to de- delineate one year from the next. So, <laughs> yeah, it's a really good event, isn't it? Uh, I I missed out on last on was it last year's? It looks like I'm having Kendall Mountain Festival uh, runnage as well. They're all blending into one, but I think it was this this year or the last one I missed because they sold out, and they normally have some tickets that you can get. There was no accommodation anywhere, and it. Nims was there, and I don't know why, but it seemed like everybody wanted to go to Kendall this year, so I missed out. How, how was it? It was really good, actually. It was really good again. Uh, I I enjoyed it a lot because I think it's I think I've been to Kendall probably for the last five or six years, and it was the first year that I didn't have a have a speaking event to do, so I got to go meet everybody catch up with a lot of people and not and not really have to do any proper work at all which was fantastic it was great to be there just as a, a an audience member for the for the for the first time actually and I, yeah i really enjoyed it i thought it was fantastic so yeah it's really nice to do that sometimes isn't it like uh, a lot of times when i go on trips i have to do some filming and photography and i do like that um, and I, I love it often, but it's also sometimes nice just to go and just think like I don't have to walk off ahead of everybody 5,000 times today on this hike to go and get the shot. Sometimes it's nice to just be there and enjoy it and soak it all up. So we normally uh, start with a few quick fire questions, Dan. So um, and then we go on to I've tried to use these cards a couple of times uh, and they have gone down pretty well so far. So we're going to have we're going we're gonna to have a go at these today as well. Um, some of them are a bit left field and I just select them at random, but but we'll see. So we'll start off. Quick fire question number one. What's your earliest memory, Dan? Uh, well, for me, that's quite a long time ago now. So I'm, so I'm struggling, <laughs> but I think it's probably I'm sure being with my parents somewhere outside it being really cold uh and probably wearing a massively unfashionable balaclava and and sort of parka jacket that being dragged outside uh in the frost or something i think i'm sure is one of my one of my earliest ones i couldn't couldn't pick the location but probably a national trust property like crawling around on the ground or something in in the in the middle of the winter i think my parents used to do an awful lot of ensuring we were outside as often as possible so very cool good parents top marks uh favorite kayaking spot outside the uk oh blimey well this is a tricky one because it it was it was the white nile in uganda i think was probably one of my favorite places on earth but since i was i haven't been back to the white nile for for a long time for maybe 10 to 15 years uh and since i was last there there's there's been it, it's sort of all a bit messed up in my mind that place because there's been two huge dams constructed on that river since i was last there and it's basically turned into a very different place both both culturally ecologically and as a kayaker it, it, it's changed in a it, dr- as dramatic a change as you could possibly ever imagine a wild place undergoing this happened since i was there 
Uh, and I, one of my, a very good friend of mine lived there. And around the time that all this was happening, the second dam was being constructed. Um, my friend passed away in a kayaking accident. And now the, the whole place is sort of tinged with the, the loss of him and the destruction of the environment of that place as well. So, so it was, it was the white Nile in Uganda, but probably not, probably I have mixed feelings about that place now, but it, it was there for, for sure. I think. Sorry, not a cheery, not a cheery <laughs> answer that one. That was terrible. <laughs> it was, I, I seem to remember, I think you talked about it in your Patagonia Action Works talk, I think. Uh, and it sounded, it sounded like an, I think it was there. It sounded like an epic trip, but we'll, we'll come on to kayaking a little bit more after. But right now, important stuff, the Marmite question. Love it, hate it, somewhere in between. Oh, Marmite. Oh, no, it's vile. Sorry. Yeah, I can't, you know. I feel ill that you've mentioned it, to be honest. <laughs> well then, even more swiftly moving on. Right, I'm gonna I'm gonna select one of these. Up first we've got Do you have a technique for keeping calm? This one might be quite fitting as a white water kayaker. Uh yes. Um I use a couple of different mental techniques. To keep calm, whether that's the top of a rapid or uh, you know about to drop into a cool while when I'm snowboarding or something, I do. I find that to often you've exerted yourself a little bit to get there, and I think it's really important to your mind can be in that kind of even just through the exertion or the adrenaline from the exertion, you can be in a kind of a fight or flight sort of state, uh, and it's really good to just to, to switch your mind off and do something different with it just for a second before you go so i either just splash my face with water two or three times and i count you know one two three when i do it because it takes your mind away from that sort of fight or flight to that sort of calculated state or sometimes you know you you it's quite good to you could look at your group and name the color of everybody's boat so you go red blue green and then that just takes your mind out of that that state where it's maybe racing a little bit and makes you a little bit calmer and a little bit more calculated. So that's my, that's the technique I use. So, and so far, it's going to mm. be proud, I think. Yeah, interesting. I've not actually come across that one before, but um, yeah, I'm going to have to add it to the list. Okay, number two. Have you ever had a religious experience? Uh, I mean, I went to a, I went to a church school uh, when I was a kid, uh, I come from a half of my family is quite devoutly Catholic. Uh, and then I went to a Church of England school uh, at primary school. And that was enough to put me off religion, I think, pretty much for life. Um, but my only my only religious experience that I've had after that was uh, before we put on a river in on the Tibetan plateau um, uh, to paddle uh, at like a canyon down into China. Um, we we visited a monastery and were uh, given some religious rites. We were sort of blessed by the monks in that monastery. They burnt a little offering of of some sort of confetti, and we spun the prayer wheels. Uh, and so that was a sort of a religious blessing we had on a journey. And um, that's possibly the most disastrous near death kayaking experience I've ever had. So um, yeah, definitely <laughs> not one for religion after that either. It's not not helped me at all. Well, we we you've you've lifted the can off the worms now. Let's can, can we can we go into that one? What what happened? Uh, so this was this was um, a river that we paddled in China. So all the all the big rivers in Asia all start in China. They all start on the Tibetan plateau, and then they they sort of this sort of the five main rivers of Asia um, cut these big deep canyons as they fall off the Tibetan plateau, sort of into the Chinese flatlands, and then. Some of them stay within China, some, you know, go into India, some, you know, become the Mekong and go into Laos. And there was one major river, the the Yellow River, that, that had uh, one of these canyons. It was the last one that hadn't been kayaked. And um, to sort of be able to sort of get into China and do a sort of a first ascent or a, an exploratory mission like that is very difficult. There's all sorts of permits and things that you need to be able to get there. Um, so we decided to just 
go there on our holidays, not tell anybody, sneak our kayaks in, you know, hire a driver and head off into the mountains and, and hope that nobody noticed. Um, and we got to the top of the Yellow River Canyon and we paddled it in like three or four days. It was super successful. We got the uh, got the sort of first ascent tick. Um, a Chinese group had tried to paddle it about 10 years before us, but uh, they didn't get to claim their first ascent because... There's various different rules on what you can call a first ascent and not. Uh, and if every member of your party drowns in the attempt, then you don't get to claim a first ascent. So they, they didn't get one. Um, but we we made it down and it was all good. But on our way down, we'd seen this other river sort of flow in from the side. And we looked on a map and we realized that this river flowed from the highest peak of that mountain range, from the Anamachan mountain range, which is a sort of super um, sacred mountain range in that part of the world. So we drive up to the top, meet these monks at the monastery at this sort of 4,000 meter peak, put our kayaks in the river and head off downstream, hoping for the best. Uh, and it turns out that hoping for the best isn't, isn't good enough. Sometimes you need to do <laughs> planning and being careful and having abilities that maybe we didn't have. Um, and it just got sort of more and more horrendous. Uh, it rained and rained and the river level went up and there was lots of landslides that blocked our passage down the river. And eventually we had to give up trying to sort of navigate downstream. We, we reached this huge landslide that blocked the whole river. There was no way past with our kayaks. So we had to abandon our kayaks, put what food we could in a bag, and then try and climb this sort of a thousand meter deep vertical canyon. Um, which took two days, including sleeping on a little ledge, uh, and then walk over. Wow. All we knew is if we walked over this sort of huge mountain and we got to the other side, there was a stream and we might find a farmstead or something by a stream. Um, but we weren't very sure. But we bumped into these sort of, on our second day with no water for two days, we bumped into these sort of caterpillar fungus collectors that were sort of roaming around on the Tibetan Plateau uh, they'd been there for two weeks and they were leaving the next day and we bumped into them and they were quite surprised to find um, sort of four white guys uh, meandering around the Tibetan plateau, lost, uh, without any food or water. But they took us under their wing and hiked us to this nearest little farmstead where the next day we waited for the mail truck and got a lift to a town, but we didn't know what town it was. Uh, and then we managed to find a bus to a bigger town and then eventually back to the city where we could sort of return to civilization. But it was this sort of four day epic journey from the very bottom of this canyon to a city where we actually knew where we were. Um, so, yeah, it was pretty exciting. Good times. Um, but yes, I think I think possibly we could have been a little bit more organized and then a little bit more planning and uh and i think some lessons were learned on that on that trip but uh still one of my <laughs> highlights uh, i think of my of my holidays that i've been on yeah it sounds awesome and i love how it's still a holiday it uh it has all the hallmarks of a proper adventure lots of stuff going wrong but then just at the end it it all comes through Sounds like an amazing trip. I've not been to Tibet, but I would love to go. It's uh, one of those places that has some special appeal. And I think the culture is really fascinating too, and history there. So um, yeah, going to have to get myself out there at some point. I've not actually done much, if any, kind of kayaking or white water kayaking. So what's the appeal? What, what, what's the experience like? And how, how does it compare to how, why has it held you in a way that maybe other sports haven't? I think, I think it's the, the ease at which it can transport you into really quite wild and remote places. You can, you can pack you know, it's very easy to pack almost 10 days of stuff into a white water kayak and then and then put in at the, you know, where a road meets a river and then in the middle of, I mean, it can be in your local village and you can put on where the road meets the river and take out an hour later and have had a little adventure in between. But also you could pack your kayak with 10 days worth of stuff and put on fly into somewhere in the Himalayas or, or, you know, spend days trekking to somewhere in the Himalayas where a path might 
cross a river and you can you can put your kayak in the river there and carry everything you need to transport yourself through such a variety of completely wild landscapes where it's maybe not possible for anybody else to go at all uh and then you can and you and the only thing that you can do is to just keep on moving downstream you know often these are places where you can't hike out halfway down you're paddling through a desert or through a canyon that is inescapable and you just know that each day you just move a little bit further downstream and that's that's all you have to do it's very it's very simple it sort of simplifies life quite a lot and i think it it's also because of that it definitely holds one of the last frontiers of very easy adventure to to go places and an exploration so you can go you know we we decided for instance, the, the story I just told you, where we had to paddle the Yellow River from the Tibetan Plateau in Qinghai province down to down to the, the flatlands there. And we literally just got on a plane with our kit and our kayaks and we went and did it. And there's very few places in the world where four guys can choose on their holiday to go and travel a place where no other humans have ever stood before uh, with such little um, support. We didn't have a huge sponsor. We didn't have a budget we didn't have you know permits you know you can do all that we didn't have a helicopter and kayaking is one of the few sports i think where that's still available you know to you don't have to be a pro sponsored athlete to do that you can just you can just book two weeks off work and and off you go and and do it that way so and i think politically when the world opens up a little bit more in like shinang province and you know, parts of the Chinese border where it, you know, sort of meets um, some of the stars, there is a lifetime's worth of first ascent kayaking still awaiting, you know, people to go and do it. Um, and I think that's that's what appeals to me. Very cool. Yeah, it definitely piqued my interest now, sowing some seeds. What about advice to get into it for somebody that's not done it before? If I have my eyes set on a big adventure in a year's time, what what should I be doing now? I mean, I think that the, the great thing about kayaking is is that it's such a huge, it's such a broad range of sports. So to go and paddle, you know, a, a sort of a gnarly waterfall filled you know, multi-day river in California or or the Himalayas is there's a learn it there's a learning curve for that and it's pretty slow. You know, it's not the quickest or easiest sport to learn and it involves being wet and cold quite a lot when you're learning that and it involves, you know, having some beat downs and, and it and it can take a while. But you can just as easily take a kayak or a canoe and paddle a completely flat wilderness multi-day through the Yukon or through Norway or and and you can have these long multi-day adventures without having the 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 sort of technical skill set you need to run hard white water you can go and have those adventures in uh just as wild just as stunning and just as remote places but just necessarily not necessarily with the same technical level of difficulty and I think that a lot of people might think that they just need to learn all that technical ability before they go off and have their big adventures. But I think in kayaking, you can have those big adventures from day one. You just need to, you know, be a little bit careful of what rivers you pick. Uh, so that's what I do. Make sure you uh, you get into the adventurous side of it early, even if it's on easier grade whitewater. But still go, you can still t- take you to some really amazing places. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, the only thing that I really have done is a two and a half week trip in the Yukon, actually, uh, with my girlfriend, and it were, and we had no skills, just put loads of stuff in a boat and just went for two and a half weeks into the middle of nowhere, and it was incredible for accessing that wilderness that you mentioned before. It was kind of, it felt like we shouldn't really be allowed to do it. We just kind of like rocked up, and they were like, "Yeah, just just take the boat," and we're like, "Really? Are we just are, are we going?" And then eight days in, I was probably, I think that's one of the most, if not the most remote that I've ever been. And it was just bears and all sorts of wild animals everywhere and no humans to be seen anywhere. And and coming from Europe, where we don't really have much proper wilderness left, it was such a incredible, humbling experience. I felt like uh, all of the words of John Muir were just like, 
inspiring me and i was it, it was it, it was a really incredible experience so um yeah it's it's and it's nice not to have needed that skill there are a few very low grade rapids that made it a little bit exciting um but we really had no clue what we were doing no i think that's the joy of it i and i love i love nothing more than like being camped on a beach with all of your stuff you know your tent or your tarp and your cookers and all your food is out and then you get up in the morning and it all packs away into this boat and you paddle away and don't leave a trace behind you and everything that you need in the whole world fits in this little boat that you're in and you don't need anything else you know and it kind of strips it all back to what's important i think yeah so let's switch gears to the Save Our Rivers side of things. So uh, you are, or yeah, you, so, so you're a co-founder of Save Our Rivers. And um, can you tell us the story of how that was born and what the kind of main objective was of the organization? So, so we, we, it was sort of born as a, I suppose, like a single issue campaign, I think was, was what it was. We'd... Uh, Myself and a lot of other kayakers have have made our homes in Betterscroyd in Snowdonia National Park in North Wales. There's a couple of real hubs where kayakers live. In you know people who are really passionate about it live in the UK. One is in one is in Dartmoor. You know one is in in is in the northeast uh, around based around the River Swale. One's in South Wales. You know sort of based around the Methuen and the Ned Beckin. And then there's another hub of kayakers that live. Around Betterscoid because we have uh, probably the best rivers in the UK. I think you know I'm not biased in any way, but uh, are in are in Snowdonia, and particularly one river called the the Avon Conway and a, a particular section of it called the Fairy Glen, where I, it's about ten minutes from my house. It's where I meet my friends every morning at dawn when it's been raining to go kayak, every night after work when it's been raining to go kayak, and I think it's not only the best possible training ground for then going and paddling abroad and doing bigger trips uh, because it has a sort of a bit of everything in it it's it's one of the sort of harder test pieces of white water in the uk it's also utterly stunning it's a triple si it's this beautiful gorge set amongst ancient woodland it's full of otters and horseshoe bats and newts it's a migratory river for salmon it's the 10th most important um spot for oceanic bryophytes in the uk uh, oceanic bryophytes are sort of mosses and lichens and things and when you're in the bottom of this gorge the whole all the walls are dripping with moisture and, and it looks like a like a rainforest you know i mean a, technically officially it is a rainforest it's a, a temperate rainforest as well and it's the most stunning place uh and then we arrived you know one day to the news we we found out I don't know, through the internet or something or through a planning, you know, application. I'm not really sure how we came across this news, but um, RWE, the multinational power company, um, were about to build or planning to build a hydropower scheme uh, on this river. They were going to build a dam upstream of the Fairy Glen Gorge, uh, this this sort of stunning wild place. And they were going to basically put the water from that gorge in a pipe for, for three miles all the way around the gorge, dewater the gorge, and then put the water back in at the bottom. Uh, we were really shocked because th this was a national park, and we didn't think like things like this should be happening in a national park. But the National Park Authority seemed to be relatively happy with the idea that, was, that this was going to happen, and had had a lot of pre-application talks with RWE. So we didn't think that the the planning system was going to stop it. Uh, the the landowner was the National Trust, and we were really shocked that they were in cahoots with. RWE as well um, and this appeared that, that the landowner was going to allow this to happen even though it's the biggest conservation charity in the UK uh, and the environmental regulator seemed to be on board as well all before we'd found out about it so we turned up to a RWE had to do a consultation meeting uh, where they spoke to stakeholders and kayakers were considered a stakeholder for this area but really their consultation was turning up and telling us what they were going to do and asking us if we wanted some money as compensation for loss of our our river, um, uh, and I think they were a little bit taken aback that the meeting with the kayakers didn't quite go according to plan. Uh, everybody was less receptive to their offers of money than they thought. Uh, I think there was some swearing. Uh, there were some quite cross voices, uh, and and 
uh, four or five of us walked out and stood in the stood in the car park and decided that there was there was no way on earth that we were going to let these people do this and um and we formed at the time a, a, a campaign group called save the Com save the conway because that was the name of the river uh and that was that was a, a group of sort of of mangy moldy kayakers that got together made a plan built an ngo made a coalition with other local conservation groups and spent three years campaigning against a multinational power company, Britain's largest landowner, uh, and two government regulating bodies, uh, and we won. Uh, and that river stayed, stayed free flowing. Still looks like it does before. Still looks like it does. 10, it did ten thousand years ago, uh, and it kind of gave us this inspiration that that everybody has a voice and that we can all stand up and do do something for the environment. And we thought we'd finish. You know, we were having a a party at my house to celebrate the fact that that we'd been successful in this campaign and we were going to get to go kayaking on our river again tomorrow and it was going to look just like it did the day before and one of the conservation groups that we'd worked with rang me at like i don't know 10 o'clock at night or 11 o'clock at night and said there's this terrible thing happening where where the welsh government is planning on diluting the environmental protection that the national parks in wales sit underneath and we need to do something about it and we meaning this very sort of, you know, well-respected conservation charity had called this group of dirtbag kayakers and said that we need to do something about this together. And that made us realize that, that all the lessons we'd learned and the voice that we'd built doing this first campaign, we had to carry on. Um, so we, we formed Save Our Rivers uh, and we launched our second campaign straight off the back of the first one, which was, we called uh, National Parks Matter, which was against changes to Welsh National Park legislation. We've gone on and, you know, supported campaigns in the Balkans and in Austria. We've campaigned against multiple, de you know, developments on rivers throughout Wales and in the rest of the UK. And we're still going now nine years, nine years later. So that's that's our story, really. Um, just shows that everybody can do something if they want to. Yeah, an incredible story at that. So huge congrats that is just awesome to hear it's very inspiring to hear of when a group especially of dirt bags can just band together and uh and really help defend key places but i wonder just just taking a step back why do you think that the national trust and um various other bodies were on board with this when their mandate is to protect these places i i think I think there's definitely there's definitely issues along um, climate change is 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 the one of the pressing issues that faces faces us uh, you know existence of our planet or existence of mankind on our planet today um, and I think some there has been a in some cases a collective rush to do anything we can to cut carbon emissions, which is very, which is critically important, but ignoring the wider ecosystems that surround important wild places. So I think there is a lack of understanding sometimes that when we look at the when we look at the threats that face the existence of human life on this planet, there was there is everybody probably a lot of people have heard of the IPCC report, which is the Interparliamentary uh, Committee on Climate Change. Uh, it has this report: we need to cut carbon by this much by you know being net zero by twenty fifty, and it's all critically important. And I'm not you know and and I need to be really careful to word that 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 is not something we should ever steer away from. But there's also a report called the IPBES, the Interparliamentary Biodiversity and Ecosystems Report, something like that, which basically lists the threats to human life on this planet. And number one is is biodiversity loss. Um, it's it's biodiversity loss. It's uh, through land use change. It's direct exploitation of species on this planet. So that is through deforestation, through overfishing. There is then climate change. Uh, there is then uh, pollution uh, and polluting of waterways, of you know, landscapes. And then the final one is um, 
uh, invasive species uh, changing, you know, transfer of species from one climate to another, from one place to another, man-made species impacting, you know, farms, agricultural species impacting other species. And I think there, were, there has been far in a lot of developments, and particularly around that time in the National Park, there was so much focus on carbon that they were forgetting the impacts of biodiversity damage and loss through land use change. Um, and, and it doesn't matter if we cut carbon to zero, if we remove all the biodiversity from our world, we're all going to die anyway. You know, it's it's we have to be very careful about the balance between maintaining intact natural processes and systems of which free flowing rivers are key because they're the systems that tie land based ecosystems to the ocean. Basically, you know, they're the, the connecting of the, the entire water, you know, the water table from from cloud to ocean. Um, and there, there has been a lack of care and understanding about that, particularly when cutting carbon through building in these ecosystems also generates a profit for, for people involved. Um, and I think that's that's the big sort of the big sort of greed money issue as well. Um, and so that's the yeah, that's that's the two, I think the two things, the lack of bigger picture thinking when it comes to how we manage our planet and uh and uh always however in you know however great you think this this these big charities are uh they always have a bottom line that they need to meet as well um and I think sometimes they get a little bit carried away with the wrong side of things mm. yes it's really interesting that i've heard it described recently as uh climate tunnel vision so there are lots of one of the best models that i've seen for thinking about the big planetary issues that we face is from the stockholm resilience center uh, the planetary boundaries and it has nine different a, a group of scientists in the stockholm resilience center who study biophysical systems and basically everything that we should be really worried about they got together and they looked at nine different challenges that humanity is facing and then tried to quantify where we are in the kind of safe operating safe operating space and where we've gone well past that. And climate change, as you say, is a gigantic issue that we're facing, and we need to be really thoughtful of that. But then you start to look around the list, and as you mentioned, biodiversity, then there's uh, nitrogen and phosphorus flows and things like uh, pol uh, pollution and toxins and all of these things. And then you can, and when you begin to look at those, you realize that it's not the only thing that we need to think about. And the, I was actually talking with somebody earlier today. It's really interesting how the Western way of thinking is we we call it atomism, like where we specialize, we hyper specialize in things and break things down into tiny constituent parts. Like we have these doctors who are, say, an oncologist or an obstetrician, or you have a most people don't even know what another person's job means because we're so specialized. And that is great. It gives us a lot of economies of scale and the ability to really become very expert in a certain field. But it also means that when we're solving problems, we tend to be very myopic. And it, when we instead take a systems thinking approach, which is like more of a kind of traditionally Eastern approach to thinking about things, like not just looking at the fact that, say, you've... Uh, you, you've got pain in your elbow, and then the typical Western physician would look at the elbow and then say, oh, well, have you banged it? Can we get, what, what should we do with the elbow? Perhaps in the systems approach, you would instead say, well, what is causing that issue? Is it referred pain? And I wonder if that thinking is part of what stops us being able to solve the problem at its at its core, we instead try to treat the symptoms. And it sounds like this is a typical example of that of that very thinking. We really need to cut carbon. There's been a lot of focus on climate change, but then we're not thinking about where that fits within the wider system. Yeah, I mean, I, I completely agree. And I, I think I think that's it. In a, in a nutshell, we're not looking holistically at the planet. We're looking in, in minutiae. And also, I mean, I think, in the West, again, we love building stuff. Like engineers love building stuff. We love <laughs> engineering things. And building a dam and a river to to generate green electricity or, or carbon, I mean, isn't green, that's the thing. 
to generate low carbon electricity, it's not even carbon free, um, is basically engineering the planet to try and solve a problem that we've caused by engineering the planet. That's 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 what it is. And the great thing about engineered solutions like building a dam or you know building building any sort of infrastructure is is there is profit tied to them as well. People make money building stuff. People don't make money leaving things alone. That's that's tricky, you know. If you're like well, you know, if we leave this forest standing, then it has this ability to support biodiversity, reduce flood impact, sequester carbon. But nobody kind of makes any money by leaving things alone. People make money by building stuff. So so we just hear repeatedly about how we're going to develop carbon capture and storage engineered techniques. And people seem to forget the fact that our entire planet you know sort of biosphere deals in carbon capture and storage that's that's what it does that's one of its key key roles you know it's it's a, a, a tree grows it sequesters carbon leaves fall off the tree they get washed into a river they get washed down the river they end up in the sea they get sequestered as limestone you know that's in a, in a, a super basic carbon capture storage thing that involves intact ecosystems from forest all the way to ocean through rivers but but nobody makes any money by leaving those alone but if you can build this massive machine that sucks in carbon from the atmosphere using big fans and pumps it into this big cavern that you've dug in the earth then there's a whole heap of money to be made doing that i think that's i think that's a problem when we have an economy that's driven by growth and driven by uh by consumption and building then we prioritize the the wrong aspects of of what we should be doing but that's that that's a really big picture question i suppose <laughs> no i i i completely hear what you're saying i think on a on a positive note there what i have seen that's encouraging is a lot more work around natural capital in in economics and finance so economists have certain ways of being able to process things and everything has to be in a monetary value and they they only understand something if you call it an externality as opposed to you say the fact that you know these indigenous communities are being affected it doesn't mean anything to them you have to translate it into like this is an externality that's not being paid for and then all of a sudden it starts to make a little bit of sense and now now, there's been a lot of work done by lots of big actors out there, the World Bank and a few others, um, uh, and they have quantified ecosystem services now and in this category that they call natural capital. And so finally, uh, the field of economics and finance are beginning to be able to appreciate what this value of nature is because they don't think in terms of like, this is a good thing to, they arguably it's beyond their mandate to, to, to think about mor morality, but even in terms of um, its, its benefits to our economy, because our economy sits within our society, which sits within our ecology, right? So we need to think about, again, this kind of systems approach. And, and it, very encouragingly, I have seen a lot more start to come out and different actors begin to realize that actually in order to you know we need pollinators we need these we need this carbon sequestration we need all of these services and here's the pound amount or the dollar amount to help you realize why this is important because apparently it doesn't translate into your models by us telling you even though they kind of know from first principles you know this is really important uh, we need to eat food if you can't eat that what if you're a grain supplier or you're a meat and dairy company what are you going to feed your cattle if uh you can if there's m massive water st stress storage and then you can no longer feed them and all of a sudden when you begin to quantify it then i think the message starts to hit home and it took a long time with climate change but fortunately it's starting to feed through um so i know that it can always seem a bit doom and gloom and we do have some incredible challenges but uh the good news is that from kind of being in the trenches there things are starting to move yeah i mean i i, mean, I hate the whole economic value placed on nature and i hate the sort of monetarization of ecosystem services but 
I think you're completely right. It's the only way with the system that we work in at the moment for things to get to get better and to get done the, the way they need to be done. And um, it's great to see things like uh, following Brexit, which is a topic I don't want to go into, but uh, following Brexit, the, the rethinking of future agricultural policy in the UK for subsidies for good or, you know, and I think that's, the way that we do have to go like it has to be like you say be driven by the monetary system that's the only way that we're going to see progress in the time scales that we have available and and there's some really good work being done in that so yeah i don't mean to be uh, utterly doom and gloom about it. it it does it does stick in my throat a little bit but it all has to be tied back to money before anybody will do anything but but if that's the way it has to be then that's the way it has to be what do you think it was that made you successful and what advice would you give to other organizations or people wanting to influence issues um i think in terms of i mean i do two, sort of two different strands of work now so so first of all uh through save our rivers we we predominantly work on protection of wild place issues uh you know protect what's left or or however you want to phrase it but you know protecting very specific areas from from development threats and we've been very successful in that i don't think there's a campaign we've fought within Wales or run ourselves directly that we've lost, which is which is really good. And I think that is because we are so passionate about those places. There's, they're not a that when we're not people when we're sort of campaigning for a bit of Wales or a bit of a national park legislation or for a river that are oh, this is, a, you know, like a KPI that we're trying to achieve with our organisation. Like, this is this is a place that I have an emotional connection to. Uh, this is, I feel, therefore, that this is not a fight that I am willing to lose in, in, in any way. And I am, in, I am invested in it. And the people that I work with at Save Our Rivers are invested in it to, to their very core, you know, and that's because the the connect the emotional connections that they have to those places means that they just can't let them go and i think that in in that type of campaigning that is that is key that is that is critical uh in my other job uh because i now work for protect our winters as well on climate this is this is a job we've been doing for uh, about eight months or something like that uh climate is a very different if, issue to work on because we're essentially it's such a broad topic and we're not working it's not a you know a river or a or a forest i can go and look at and get and get connected to in in this way and for me working on climate we're working on systemic change we're working on cultural change you know we're working on moving the system by using kind of grassroots activism techniques with people and for that the the what what sort of drives me there is is the people aspect of it knowing that people are passionate about this knowing that people want to do better want the system to change and will will work with us on it that's that's the key for me it's sort of being passionate about the community in the same way that i might be passionate about the places and i think that's that's what you've got to have you've got to have that kind of connection whether it's to the people or whether it's to the places you've got to feel it I think, and that, that kind of drives successful work, hopefully. And what specific campaigns are you doing there? What what kind of things? Because it's just, like you mentioned, just a huge topic. Um, but you mentioned the kind of grassroots activism. But what are some, yeah, what are some of the projects that you're working on? Well, so there's, I think uh, we've, last autumn, we, we've just sort of finished phase one. Of a, we have different sort of st strategic priorities at Protecto Winters Europe. Um, so one of them just, I mean, we have just to sort of clear up what Protecto Winters Europe is a little bit. Protecto Winters was started in 2007 in the States by Jeremy Jones, sort of professional snowboarder. It was very winter sports focused at the beginning. And now it's it's grown in the United States to be the voice of pretty much the entire outdoor community, or they call it the outdoor state, you know, in their American way, um, about uh, about action for climate change. And that moved across to Europe. Uh, 
I think the first protect Winters in Europe was in Norway, uh, and we've got the UK and Switzerland, and we now have nine active chapters in Europe, uh, right across Europe, uh, working on their projects. And it was decided last year, uh, or sort of late 2020, that what they really needed now was a coordinating body for Europe to sort of make sure all the chapters are speaking with the same voice, aligning on the same topics, but still having the space to run nationally relevant campaigns as well, whether that's a campaign around a national election in their country, but then also come together on these bigger topics. And that's where Protect the Winters Europe, which is the coordinating body that I work for, came in. Uh, that, that was founded in 2020. I came on board in 2021, and we've just had our third member of staff come on board this year as well. So we're growing. Uh, and so we're trying to run those sort of pan-European campaigns and um, so last autumn we worked on a campaign called divest the dirt which was targeting uh the financial industry asking retail banks and and in one country's case the uk's case pension providers to stop investing in the exploitation of new fossil fuels so the international energy agency said that after 2021 there is no need for any new fossil fuel exploration anywhere in the world. No new coal mines or coal mine extensions, no new oil or gas fields anywhere. There is enough fossil fuel currently in production to break all the carbon budgets that we have uh, and make us unable to meet the Paris 2015 target of net zero by 2050. So stopping new exploration is a, is a, is a pretty easy one. So we, we were asking our community to contact their banks or their pension provider or their council's pension provider and, and ask them, you know, about the policies that they have for in, new investment in fossil fuels and telling them that we are expecting better from our banks and better from our pension providers. So that was that was last year's campaign. Uh, and then we've just finished. Um, our other big strategic priority for this year is transport, transport and mobility, because transport is depending on which set of figures you look at, either the largest or the second largest, you know, greenhouse gas emission creator in Europe. So there's electricity production and there's transport and one's at like 30% and one's at like 29%. So they're, they're pretty equal. Uh, but the, the thing about transport is it's the only sector that is still growing in emissions. And it's probably also our audiences, the, uh, the sort of outdoor communities, it's the biggest climate impact they have um, from their sport will be how they travel to do that sport, whether they go by car or plane. Or, and this is a, a huge campaign for us in both in terms of driving for better systems, in terms of more connective, easier to use public transport systems, but also cultural change, asking people to leave the car behind, leave the plane behind, travel by train, travel by bike. And so that's a, that's a campaign that we're, we're sort of really deep in at the moment. We've just had a mobility week where we asked all our community to travel uh, as sustainably as possible for a whole week, uh, which was great. 20 companies got on board, had all their members of staff traveling sustainably. You know, our community logged over 20,000 kilometers of sustainable travel, mostly by bike, uh, by using a tracking app. And that's that's the other campaign we're on at the moment. So. So yeah, transport and finance are the big targets for this year with Protect Talents Europe. Really, really cool. Awesome. The the divest the dirt uh, campaign. I think it's a really interesting one. And I think a lot about because I think for banks it completely makes sense to say to banks, you are not allowed to lend to any new projects for drilling or for oil and gas exploration or thermal coal or tar sands. Because let's say there's, for example, a Polish coal mine they want to, uh, they want to set up now, they need 100 million. And if uh, lots of banks say, no, we're not giving you the money, then they can't build that, that coal plant anymore. And then we've, we've achieved our goal of staying within our carbon budget. With pension plans, it's really interesting because in the, without getting boring with it, they call it the secondary market. So so the company has already, let's say it's ExxonMobil, they've already sold their share and now somebody else owns it in the secondary market, which might be your pension fund. If they sell it, they can often sell it to a private equity fund who don't have shareholders looking into what they're doing, or it might go to some less scrupulous or less caring owner 
And it's a really interesting one because do you what impact do you actually have on the company if you divest that? Because then you lose your ability to vote your proxies and say, we want new board members who are more climate conscious. And you also lose your seat at the table to be able to engage with them and say, we know that you have terrible get fuel, uh, fossil fuel emissions right now. Your carbon numbers look terrible. Uh, we're not happy with this. You need to do something. And some of them, not all of them, ExxonMobil probably is one that uh, sticks out as being not particularly well poised for the transition. But there are some like NextEra, for example, who are looking at transitioning to renewables. And they know that their, their business model, or most of them know, that they're going to be stuck with a load of stranded assets if they don't do something. Uh, and so it's it's an interesting one. I don't think it's black and white, but do, what what do you guys what do you guys think about that? I know I, I just just to be clear, my goal is I am very much a environmentalist and but I'm also the kind of pragmatist and try to be uh it try to engage with the issues and think about what is going to get us to the outcome that we want. Yeah, I mean I think I think when we when we with the name divest the dirt in the campaign i think it's it's we need to be clear that we're we weren't asking our community to divest from their bank if their bank invested in fossil fuel exploration because obviously if you're no longer a customer at that bank you don't have a seat at that table with there's some uh eu eu taxonomy legislation coming out which means all banks are going to have to report the the esg the environmental social governance aspects of their investments uh, and that's coming out this year uh, and what we were basically asking our community to say is i bank with you currently i'll be watching what comes out in this eu taxonomy you know reports that you your esg reporting that you have to do and we'll be we'll be watching you and that's important to me um we weren't sort of telling people that your banks invest in this so pull your money out you know we were basically saying what we want to be doing is as customers pushing our banks to make the right choices. And we're seeing that a little bit as well. I think in terms of pension funds as well, I mean, when you when you look at, we're looking at two things, and it's basically the same with pension funds as it is with, it is with banks as well. There's the, the shares they hold in existing oil companies, and then there's the lending they do for new exploration. And that can come from sort of both of those pots. And if we want to move the real economy, telling banks to divest their shares doesn't really have a massive impact because those shares will be sold and they will go somewhere else. And the real economy doesn't necessarily move that much. New lending, uh, IPOs, initial purchase offers, things like that, that's how we move the real economy. So when we're asking for systemic change, that's what we were really focusing on, the no new lending to, to fossil fuel companies. That's what we want. In terms of divesting from shares that they already own, you're, you're completely right. That has a much more diluted effect. You know, it does have an impact, but it doesn't shift the real economy in such a bold way as no new, as no new lending would. However, I think that's really down to a a moral and a cultural change perspective. In the fact is, you, I think we keep thinking of you know. Is a bank I'm a customer of, you know, doing this bad thing, you know, in you know, owning shares in this. But actually, we need to just take it back to the fact that no, that's my money. Like, so therefore, do I indirectly own shares in this fossil fuel company? And I'm, am I personally comfortable with that or not? Um, and I think that's a kind of more of a moral standpoint than a than a than a a standpoint that we're chasing for its impact on the real economy that's the no new lending side of things i think we wanted people through the other the other aspect to think about where their money sits and what their money is doing in the same way as they think about what they eat or how they travel uh, and to to know that you can have that 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 sort of that sort of control over your impact as well and your control over your impact in a way that is far more meaningful than stopping eating meat or anything like that. Not that there's anything wrong with stopping eating meat, and it's great that people do that. But you know, there's a really good sort of number that said if you if you green your pension fund, your personal carbon footprint 
will your all your pensions and your savings if you put those all entirely into green funds your personal carbon footprint will reduce 21 times more than stopping flying changing your energy provider and stopping eating meat all combined it's huge you know the, the personal the personal wow. side of it however that doesn't necessarily mean that that carbon isn't being produced somewhere else but it's nice to know that it that you, you're having that personal moral decision making ability sits within you as well so so yeah it's a bit of both it's a bit of it's a it's a bit of both i think that yeah feeling like you're doing the right thing making the right personal choices but also having the aspect around new lending which is moving the real economy and making a difference as well so it's sort of a a dual a dual pronged approach yeah i couldn't agree more that it's really important that we're more thoughtful about where our money's going what we're what we're investing in and uh, peeling back the hood to really think about, is this something I want to be a part of and what can I do to really move the needle? Well, Dan, it's been awesome to chat. I've really enjoyed digging into a few of these things and I'm sure we could go on for hours and hours. But um, if people want to learn a little bit more about uh, protect our winters or save our rivers, where are the best place for them to go? Uh, I mean, I, I think... Like everybody now, a lot of our comms goes out through Instagram. So it's Save Our Rivers on Instagram. It's Protect Our Winters Europe on Instagram. Or we're protectourwinters.eu is the website for Protect Our Winters. And then, and then saveourrivers.org is the, is the website for Save Our Rivers. Um, we're, uh, both are pretty active. Uh, Protect Our Winters has been super active just recently, coming out the back of our mobility campaign. Um, and then Save Our Rivers is going to be getting a lot more active coming up. There's some huge campaigns happening both in the, the, in the Lake District uh, around the River Kent, uh, but also there's some huge projects in Austria where we'll be supporting uh, WWF Austria, uh, Wet Tyrol and Free Rivers Fund, which are NGOs working out there against uh, a, a massive project called the Carmetal Project, um, which is which is a, a hydro project on a scale of which we haven't seen in Europe for a long time in terms of its environmental destruction. So that that's one to follow coming up this year with Save Our Rivers as well. And we'll be telling people how they can get involved. Um, yeah, we're on Facebook and Twitter and stuff like that. Does anybody use Facebook anymore? I'm not, I'm not really sure, but we're there just in case they do. <laughs> I don't. I don't, I don't think so. But um, yeah, we'll definitely be following those. Those uh, Best of luck with that. Um, keep up the good work. And we'll add all the links to the show notes. So Dan, thanks again for coming on. And listeners, thanks for tuning in. So uh, until next time, happy adventuring.